gathered together. Hey, we've got two or more, so we're good. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 2 out of the Message Translation. I want you woven into a tapestry of love, in touch with everything there is to know of God. Then you will have minds confident and at rest, focused on Christ, God's great mystery. All the richest treasures of wisdom and knowledge are embedded in that mystery and nowhere else. And we've been shown the mystery. I'm telling you this because I don't want anyone leading you off on some wild goose chase after another so-called mystery or the secret. My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the, empty, and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see and hear him clearly. You don't need a telescope. You don't need a microscope or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you, too. His power extends over everything. Entering into this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in, insiders, not through some secretive initiation rite, but rather through what Christ has already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. If it's, an, if it's an initiation ritual you're after, you've already been through it by submitting to baptism. Going under the water was a burial of your old life. Coming up out of it was a resurrection. God, raised you, God raising you from the dead as he did Christ. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive, right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. So don't put up with anyone pressuring you into details of diet, worship services, or holy days. All those things are mere shadows cast before what was to come. The substance is Christ. Don't tolerate people who try to run your life, ordering you to bow and scrape, insisting that you join their obsession with angels and that you seek out visions. They're a lot of hot air, that's all they are. They're completely out of touch with the source of life, Christ, who puts us together in one piece, whose very breath and blood flow through us. He is the head and we are the body. We can grow up healthy in God only as he nourishes us. So then, if with Christ you're put all that, you've put all that pretentiousness and infantile religion behind you, why do you let yourselves be bullied by it? Don't touch this, don't taste that, don't go near this. Do you think things that are here today and gone tomorrow are worth that kind of attention? Such things sound impressive if said in a deep enough voice. They even give the illusion of being pious and humble and, and ascetic but they're just another way of showing off, making yourselves look important. I think we heard a little bit about that on Sunday as Jason was sharing. It's so tempting to want to defend, but when that veil is cast, it is, and someone gave me an analogy a long time ago, if you're standing on a stool and someone else is down there, it's much easier for them to pull you off the stool than for you to pull them up on the stool. And sometimes we need to speak truth and love and just walk away. And, you know, we're coming up on the holidays, so this is on my heart. Um, there are a lot of 
zealous, enthusiastic Christians who I think their hearts are right, but who have it wrong. It's not about the holy days. It's not about the day on the calendar. It's not about the trees and the trinkets. It's about Jesus Christ. And it's a time for us to celebrate. It's a time for us to share with friends and family that we don't always get to share with. You know, it's, it's just, it's a just, I don't know, it's our way, right? So live it. I like how it said it. Stop reading it, stop studying it, stop learning it, just live it. And know that what you say, where you are, and what you do is exactly as it should be. Amen. And God has blessed it. And as Peter said, I like to say, you are blessed and highly favored. I need to say that more often. I haven't said that in a while. You are all blessed and highly favored. You are Jesus Christ. There is no end to him and no beginning to you. You are his. His blood and his breath flow through each and every one of us. And, and, you know, it's not the unholy thing that taints the holy. It's the holy that makes the unclean clean. So, anyway, be bold and live it out loud. In Jesus' name. it all, Lord, that just as the word says, Lord, that we can be bold, that we can rest knowing that you have finished it, Lord, Jesus, that you are healing, Lord, you are divine help, Lord, you are strength and you are power, Lord, that you encourage each and every one, Lord, who is here, Lord, who can't be here, Lord, that your ministering spirits, Lord, encourage us, Lord, that your word would come alive in our hearts, Lord, become the words of our mouth, Lord, we would see the fruit of them, Lord, the fruit of your sacrifice, the fruit of your labor, as we simply believe, Lord, we speak.
speak your word and we stand. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for those faithful ones, Lord, and we just ask that you increase, Lord, that you bring the increase. Lord, that your word is spoken, Lord. It is not void. It will not return to you void, Lord. Jesus, grace be multiplied. The grace would be multiplied in this house and through these people, Lord. The grace would be multiplied and have its work, Lord. Wherever grace flows, it brings life. Where grace flows, it brings healing. Where grace flows, it brings deliverance, Lord. It brings prosperity, Lord. It brings strength. It brings peace. It brings joy. Because it brings you, Lord. It's who you are. It is who you are, the very essence of your spirit, Lord, that is one with ours. Thank you, Lord, that we are heirs and joint heirs with you, Lord, closer than a brother. Lord, the mystery of the two becoming one, Lord, the mystery of your body one with you, Lord. Jesus, the mystery that when two or more are gathered, Lord, that you are in our midst, Lord. That every word spoken, every prayer, every tear, Lord, is not in vain, Lord, but is precious to you. We love you and we thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us for this time, Lord. That you've chosen us to be bearers, to be light and salt in this world, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for the testimonies of what your grace has done of what your grace will continue to do, Lord, that it has no end and it is no beginning, Lord. Jesus, we give you thanks and praise that you are wonderful, that you are good, Lord, and that your mercy endures. Jesus, that no matter what the enemy would come against us with, Lord, no matter what comes against us, Lord, that grace does much more abound that you will raise a standard, Lord, and that we have no fear, Lord. Jesus, that you are good, Lord. You are good, Lord. Jesus, that you encourage the weary, Lord. Give rest to the weary. Encourage those, Lord, who are weary in you, who are weary in well-doing, Lord. Strengthen those who need strength, Lord encourage those who need encouragement. Lord, we rest in you, Lord. We lay down the burdens of this life, the burdens of this world, the burdens of the circumstances that surround us, Lord. We put our trust and our hope in you. We choose you, Lord, and we choose to hope. We choose to see past the circumstances into what is unseen. The unseen promises of your word, we will believe and stand upon them until with our eyes we see the fruit of those promises in our lives. We will not give up, Lord, and we will not remain silent, Lord. We will not. Jesus. 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 The name above all names. Um, and just a reminder that there will not be a children's program this year. We are actually going to have a birthday party for Jesus for the kids. So that's what um, we chose to do in our little meeting. We decided to do that. Are okay. Going to be teaching the youth at, at the Airbnb? Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm all for that. <laughs> This Friday, Eastern Gate House of Prayer, um, just come and be restored. I just feel like this is going to be a time of restoration and renewal. Um, I just feel like there's just a lot right now, just pressing and pressing. And so um, anyway, come and be encouraged in Jesus' name. And the Gideons, this Sunday, November 16th, pray about an offering for them. All right, let's speak the word. 
Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Lord. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease germ and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Abraham's blessings are mine. Yes, Lord. All right. James, you want to come take the offering tonight? Please and thank you.
There's no one like you, Lord. No one like you, Lord. There's no one like you, Lord. No one like you, Lord. No one like you, Lord. Oh, Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. Linger on my lips that I might stand in this hole.
If I could just see your face. Moses stood on a mountain, waiting for you to pass by. You put your hand over his face, so in your presence he wouldn't die. And all of Israel's soul glory, and it shines down through the age. Now you call. I stood on the mountain. I need you, Lord, to pass by. Lord, I want to see your glory. I thank you, Lord, that you died, that I may live. Let us see. But I know that there's something more than the ark of your presence. Lord, your spirit came in me and I was born among the kings and the peasants. Lord, we need i 
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you tonight, Lord. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for guaranteeing us that we will see the end, Lord, that we will follow through, Lord, because in you, Lord, we are always conquering. Hallelujah. No enemy, no weapon. Nothing, Lord, that comes against us can prosper, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the victory guaranteed in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. We rebuke every lie of the enemy. We come against every attack, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, sickness is under our feet, disease, fear, poverty. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you for the victory, Lord. Thank you that what the devil means for evil, you will turn for our good. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for showing us, Lord, that when the, when the enemy feels uh, threatened, he attacks in every, op- every opportunity, in every area, but he cannot prevail. Hallelujah, Jesus. He's defeated. He's a defeated foe, and we will not give in Hallelujah. to the intimidation and the lies of the devil. Hallelujah. For you are the truth, the light, and the way, Lord. The victory is in you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, worship team. And you too, Sally. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I told uh, Mike earlier, I'm going to be brief tonight. This has been a weird week to say the least I think everybody's pretty well tired not in the spirit amen but so we're not giving in hallelujah we're just going to uh, be a little brief tonight a lot of scriptures though so uh, that'll be good amen we're not giving in to the enemy praise the Lord he has to succumb to us praise the Lord hallelujah Jesus so amen Suzanne just pretty much said everything that needed to be said, and it's all in agreement with what I have, so I'm just dotting the I's and crossing the T's and putting an exclamation point on the end of what she said, praise the Lord. But I want to talk about life and death. It's been on our minds a lot here lately, but this is a different way of approaching it, looking at it. So I want to begin with uh, John chapter 15 and verse 5. Just read a couple of scriptures here to get started, and then we'll sprinkle them throughout. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Translation that I don't recognize. Praise the Lord. Unlike the minister we saw the other day, I still use the King James. Not because I think that the others are of the devil. It's just that that's what my Bible is. King James. Praise the Lord. Amen. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Lord. Without him, we can't do anything. Praise God. All right, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. Second Peter two twenty five. Mm-hmm. Well, let me have another look here. Yeah, Second Peter two twenty five. 
Second Peter. Oh, I'm yeah, I'm looking at uh, 222. That's right. Second Peter. I was going to be brief. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Second Timothy. I had it marked in my Bible, but that didn't help you any, did it? Second Peter two, or excuse me, Second Timothy two twenty five. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now we just read that we can't do anything, right? We just abide in Him. He's the vine, we're the branches. We can't do anything, right? Then Second Timothy here he says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So, Christianity is not, nor has it ever been, about keeping us, humans, amen, an effort on our part to obey God's commands in the Bible. <laughs> I wish there were more of you here so I could see more of uh, kind of undisbelieving faces. <laughs> but that's a fact. Christianity has never been about it, and it isn't to this day, about human effort to obey the commandments of God in the Bible. That is performance-based religion that opposes the truth that apart from Christ we can do nothing. There you go. Praise the Lord. Now, sadly for a lot of Christians, this life is more about doing than believing. It's about striving to avoid sin and to do right instead of pursuing this intimate relationship with God. Romans chapter 7 and verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we are held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Remember, I'm talking about life and death here. Romans, let's go on and, and read uh, Romans 8, 1 through 6. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, we've, we've read that and had it taught to us that being carnally minded is being worldly and doing naughty things and what have you. And, and to be spiritually minded is to be perfect and do all the righteous things. That's not true. To be carnally minded is to be legally minded. That's what the scriptures prior to that, that's the whole context of that uh, dialogue that's going on there, or monologue that's taking place there. So we come to verse 6 and he's telling us to be carnally minded is to be dead. Right? As far as God's concerned, you're operating still in that dead spirit of human effort. The last verse that you read, Suzanne, was about pride. 
Human pride. That's the problem that, that we all struggle with. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So to be grace minded and not legal minded is life. It's spirit life. That's what being spiritually minded is. Right? It's not about knowing more legal terms or more law. It's about being grace-minded. It's about being Christ-focused. Praise the Lord. So, legalism, based on these scriptures and many others, legalism is a killer. Praise the Lord. And grace and truth brings another thing that Suzanne said, healing. And it brings life. Praise the Lord. Most, uh, most Christians operate the way I mentioned Sunday about Mephibosheth. They're breathing out shame all the time. But Jesus has come to set us at the right hand of the Father, seated with him in heavenly places, where there is no more shame, where there's no more condemnation, he says. Amen? So to those who are trying to be perfected by the law, Paul says in... in uh, Galatians 5, uh, 3 and 1, who has bewitched you? Now, this isn't Samantha. This is demonic. Right. Praise the Lord. Look at, uh, let's look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 15. Now, again, reading this in the context of what Paul's talking about. He's talking to people that had been born again by the Spirit of God, experienced that, and then went back to legalism, to try to perfect their, their, their walk, their Christianity, right? So here he says, where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Now here's what he's saying. You were very happy. You were blessed. Where is that? What happened? Where, where's your happiness gone to? He could tell right away something had happened. Their joy was gone. Amen? Where's your joy now? That's what he's saying. Praise God. Look at, uh, here's, here's what grace says. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Where's your joy? Where, what happened to you? Amen? According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us into the, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Amen? That joy, that revelation, that joy needs to be in all of us. The joy of our salvation. Yes. The joy that it's finished. That it isn't something we're still working out. That it isn't something we're still working on. Amen. It's the joy of our salvation. We need to go beyond just living a Christian life. Amen. Praise God. We need to go on from living a Christian life to knowing Christ. That's the, that's the whole object here. It isn't about living a certain way. It's about knowing a certain one. Amen. Uh, John 17 and verse 3. It's amazing how we make it about living, and then Jesus tells us what life is. This is life eternal, or this is God life. This is life after salvation, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Nothing in there about rules or anything else. It's about having the relationship with God. It's about knowing him. That's what our life is supposed to be about. Let me show you how even uh, uh, David recognized this in one of the Psalms, in Psalms 126. Uh, we'll just do the whole thing. It's only six verses, but it, it shows you what happens when people wake up. What, you know, when they get this understanding of God, when they have this encounter, if you will, amen, uh, to the truth of God. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Amen? Then was our mouth filled with laughter. They came alive to God. They were dead. They were in bondage. And then they've been set free. 
Amen. Their mouth, their, our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. It's just like, this is like a parallel scripture to another scripture that we've read, thinking it's morose and kind of scary and all that. But God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you're sowing legalism, if you're, if you're always confessing fault and guilt and shame, that's what you end up reaping, condemnation. Amen? Uh, the truth is, you, the revelation that you get, that you really understand, determines the revelation that you live in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When you really get revelation, it will determine the life that you live. God is not mocked. Whatever I declare him to be is what he ends up being. If he's some ogre, some I'm going to get you, God, then I'm going to live my life. If that's my revelation of God, then my life is going to reflect that. But if my revelation is in, in tune with the truth, that is by grace and grace alone, that has, Jesus has completed this thing and finished this, then I'm going to wake up. I may have been weeping in church until I get the revelation, then I'm going to start rejoicing. I may have come in with tears, but I'm going out with joy. I'm sowing, amen, and I'm going to reap the results of this revelation. I'm going to reap the results of what God has done, and that is joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's not enough joy in the church. There's not enough laughter in the church. I know I say things sometimes, and people laugh, and they almost feel guilty, because we're in church, or else they feel embarrassed for me. Don't worry, I feel embarrassed enough for myself. I don't need any help, praise the Lord. But I think, this is, this is, we're supposed to be enjoying this thing. This is supposed to be about enjoying what God has done for us. We're supposed to be happy, amen? We're supposed to be joyous. We're supposed to be laughing. There, there's enough uh, grief and sorrow and crap in this world and its fallen condition to deal with. That we should try to, in every way to find things to laugh at, things to be happy about, things to rejoice in. And the, the greatest thing that we can rejoice in is being in Christ. If we can be aware of that, have that revelation, we can live out of that revelation. We can have joy even when we're not happy. Amen. You know, happy and sad, that stuff happens. That's part of this world. But you can have joy in the midst of it. Yes. Yep. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a question of bondage versus liberty. It's a question of death versus life. Amen. There's a lot of dead Christians, I'm sorry to tell you. They're carnally minded. And the result is death. They're not spiritually alive. They're, to be spiritually alive is to have joy. To be spiritually alive is not walking around, you know, prophesying doom and gloom to everybody and judgment, to, to be spiritually alive is to have the joy of the Lord. Yes. Is to bring some happiness to people. Is to have people say, wow, I want that. There's enough sadness. Yep. There's enough sorrow. There's enough doom and gloom in the world, in the natural. We don't need, I mean, that last thing we need to be doing is telling them, you know, and this is nothing compared to what God's going to do. Praise the Lord. What God wants to do is cause us to rejoice and to laugh and to be happy. That's exactly what the psalmist is telling us. Praise the Lord. John chapter 6, verse 63. I'm going to tell you this. If, if I die before you all do, don't be, you know, don't be moping and doping around at my funeral. I'd rather there was laughter. I was rather there... You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I see, we've been to so many funerals lately, and I understand the sorrow. I understand respect. But come on, man. Not for a Christian. Uh -uh. 
That's the wrong attitude. I, I, I think, you know, we need to have a celebration of life lit real in reality, not just something we say from the pulpit and then go on boo-hooing about it. Praise. Praise the Lord. Amen. We may all just get raptured out of here and you won't get a chance to, but I'm just saying, not, a, not for me. I, I'm not, I don't want it. I don't want it. I, I, I wouldn't want anybody, you know, hey, it's good. It's good where he is. Hallelujah. It's all good. Amen. Amen. It's the spirit that quickeneth. Got it? Yep. That's talking about life that gives life. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. That's the carnality. The words that I speak unto you, they are not carnal. They're not about legalism. They're not about religion. They are spirit and they're life. If you read this word with any, any sense of revelation at all in terms of the spirit, you're going to find life, not death, not doom and gloom. But if you, I'm telling you, you can read the very same words, and most of us have had it preached to us or read it ourselves within that context, and it looks like death. Uh -huh. Am I right? Yep. Paul said, it's like a parade. We, us, and we are the crown, the victory for Jesus. And to some, it's death. It's the odor of death. Uh -huh. To some, it's the aroma of life. Uh -huh. We are a sweet savor in the nostrils of God. Mm -hmm. That same smell of life and victory to the person who sees God as this angry, judgmental, it is the scent of death. Praise the Lord. The sad truth is there's a lot of Christians that stink, that smell like death. And it's no wonder that people run from them yeah. and want nothing to do with it. There ought to be, if you're going to use that metaphor of aroma or smell, there ought to be a perfume about us. There ought to be a, a smell of victory. That's what Paul called it because they would throw flowers before them as the victors came through. And that, that ought to be what... That ought to be what the bystanders, you know, the people that are outside the battle, that are just out there kind of watching the whole thing, the unbelievers I'm talking about. Right. That ought to be the, the, the image that's projected to them. This stuff, this smells good, you know. You know what I mean? Right. That's the way we ought to be to them. That's what Paul said. We, to, to the unbeliever, to the people that reject the goodness of God, the grace of God, it has the smell of death on it. But the very same person, the very same word to the next person it smells like roses, you know? It smells great. It smells like victory. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. It smells like victory. Praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Okay, what we all need is freedom in the spirit. What we need is life in the spirit, right? Yep. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. I'm encouraging you. If you're not happy, fake it. <laughs> fake it till you get happy, you know? There's enough morose and, you know, dismal and gloomy out there. We don't, we don't need that in the church. Now, the Lord is that spirit, the spirit of life, right? The spirit of liberty. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Right. Praise the Lord. So how do we get there? Right? Right? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. I'm talking about how to get there. To that place of liberty to the spirit even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace and if by grace 
then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Praise the Lord. Anytime a person, a church, a denomination adds anything to that equation, in other words, anything to Christ and Him only, anytime there's any church, person, denomination, whatever, tries to add anything to that equation, they have crossed into carnality. I don't care how spiritual they declare themselves to be or that they look, they have crossed into legalism, and which is carnality. Right. Amen. They have gone from life to death. Right. Look, at, look at the very next verse here, verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest are blinded. Now, you couldn't find anybody any more religious than Israel, and they had the truth. Yeah. But they were carnally minded. Right. That, that's why when Paul's talking to the Jews, when he's preaching to Jews, he's always talking about that. When he's talking to the Galatians who drifted back into carnality, who went back into legalism, he's talking carnal. Mm -hmm. He's saying, you're blind. Mm -hmm. Every time the law is preached, there's still a veil. The veil still comes over their eyes. In other words, they're dead to the truth, to the reality of grace. Praise the Lord. Titus uh, chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's from life, amen, or from death to life. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, 16 through 19. This goes to the point of pride that Suzanne mentioned. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I put myself back under the law, I make myself a sinner. Mm -hmm. Right? Because the law is going to judge me guilty. Right. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, yeah. that I might live unto God. Come on. Praise the Lord. Yeah. From death to life. How? By grace. By Jesus. By by what Christ has done. That ought to make people happy. Yeah. That ought to make people have joy. That ought to make people want to just throttle the next person that comes up to them and starts talking to them about do, 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 do. Uh, living a Christian life. Mm -hmm. a living a Christian life isn't what you do. It's who you are. It's who you know. Right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Mm -hmm. That's pride. That's self-effort. Right. There's a way it seems right, makes sense from a worldly perspective. Amen? Right. But the end thereof are the ways of death. L look at uh, chapter 16 of Proverbs and verse 25. And and you'll see what he's getting at here. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. 16.25. That is what, what you just read? What was 14.12? There 
is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Right? Yeah. Look at uh, Isaiah 54, verse 1. And, and try 16. Let's, let, let's look at this. 1622. 1622. Isaiah? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Proverbs. It's not it either. Just a minute. Let me let me just look it up here. Sixteen twenty-six. Well, praise the Lord. what the scripture is now, but it's, it's about pride. Let me, let me just look briefly here. I'd really like to find it again. Blame you, James. That's where I was when I was doing this. <laughs> All right, go back to uh, Proverbs fourteen twelve. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, I can't remember the scripture. It's in Proverbs, but I'll have to look it up. But it goes on to say that the works of man are pride. And they are cut off. How does it, let's see, how does it say? Uh, they bear no fruit. I'm obviously paraphrasing. But the but the companion scripture to that is Isaiah 54, verse 1. Which is, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Bring forth it a saying, and cry aloud, thou that didst not prevail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. The prideful man is separated from God or hasn't got the connection and cannot bring forth fruit. Mm -hmm. And here's what he tells us. To those who don't put any effort into it themselves. You understand what I'm saying? To those who are not trying to make this happen, they are like uh, the remnant. Unlike Israel, who is the married wife, but unfruitful because they're, it's their labor. They're, they're trying to make something happen, but they cannot. Uh, praise the Lord. Go back to Galatians chapter 2. Let's try this. Go back to Galatians chapter 2, verse uh, 16 through 19. 
If, we, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Mm -hmm. Amen. We, we are married to God. But when we operate from the self, uh, you know, uh, effort, it is there no fruit can come forth. What does he say in John 15, 5? Except you abide in me, you can do nothing of yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? If you abide in me, you bear forth much fruit. Now, Isaiah 54 and verse 1 is talking about those religious people, single, barren, that's us, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not prevail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, mm -hmm. saith the Lord. Why? Because the married wife is typified in Israel who are trying through their own effort mm -hmm. to produce to, to bear fruit. Right. Amen? But he tells us throughout the whole, the whole uh, chapter of Isaiah 54 that those who are not working, those who are not putting forth their own effort mm -hmm. are the ones who end up bearing all the fruit, who broaden their tents, lengthen their stakes, uh, you know, uh, break forth on the right hand, break forth on the left, mm -hmm. because as, as, it's, as he summarizes it, and we get to the end of it, he said, because... No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. Yeah. Not through their own effort, okay? Mm -hmm. well, I just really belabored that. We could have been out here 15 minutes ago if I would have actually written down the scripture I needed. John chapter 14 and verse 6. And this is the last scripture. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen. 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 It's not by our effort. It's by his effort. Amen. It's by what he's done. And that makes all the difference between life and death. Amen. The life that I live, it's no longer I that live it. It's Christ in me. Amen. Amen. I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet it's not me that lives, but it's the spirit that lives. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 If we ever understand that, no matter what comes against this, we can still have joy. Amen. We are eternal beings. From the moment we were born again, we were destined to never die again. Amen. Amen. Amen? Who and what we really are, our personalities, our character, our who and what we really are, will live forever. Amen. Including this same gray matter. <sighs> Hallelujah, but it's just totally renewed. Amen. We're In an instant, we're changed. Praise God. Hallelujah. We need to be happy. We need to get beyond the, you know, the The reggae, you know, don't worry, be happy. We need to just be happy. We need to have joy. We need, in the face of, of tragedy and sorrow, we need to have joy. I'm not saying we should be happy, that we should just be laughing, and laughing it off. I'm saying, but we can still have joy. When it's people that we know, that know the Lord, whatever they're going through, God will work it out for good. Somehow, some way, it may not seem like it, it may not look like it at the moment, but everything we do, we're to do by the Spirit. That means we're not looking at legalism, we're not looking at judgment, we're not looking at condemnation, we're looking at victory. We're always looking that God is going to do something positive. Everything that's happening to this church, and it's lots of things that we're, that, that we're not even talking about. I mean, there are things in people's personal lives that they're not necessarily sharing with me. But I know we're not unique. What Sally and I have been going through, uh, Mike and others, uh, 
those are just things that are on the surface everybody can see. And they're painful, and they, they do hurt, and they, are, they wear you down. They wear you, and you get tired, and you just, you know, your mind just kind of boggles, which is evident from my message tonight, <laughs> praise the Lord. But, but at the same time, there are things going on in everybody's life in this church that I'm concerned about. I mean, it's true everywhere, but I'm saying right here. And I'm saying this is the enemy. But he cannot, I just told you, he can't, no weapon formed against us can prosper. It may look like it had. It doesn't say there won't be weapons formed. It doesn't say they won't come against you. In fact, it says just the opposite. They will be formed. They will come. But they cannot prevail. They cannot prosper. There has to be, there is something here, as, as unbelievable as that might seem, that God is birthing. In a place where it looks like there should be no birth. It looks forsaken. I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. I'm not saying it's at the expense of other people that have, have you know, died or whatever. I'm saying the enemy does what the enemy does. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God is going to bring forth life from that. Amen? You... you you know, you don't have to be. I, we were at a funeral today. I, I haven't known this guy since I was a kid. But it's still depressing. Yes. And he's a Christian. Yes. But his grandson dates my granddaughter and has for several years. And he's like family. He's there for all, every holiday and all that stuff. So, you know, we were there. It's still a bummer. Yes. Death is the final victory. Yes. And I'm saying, if we're... If, if we're alive, we need to act like we're alive. There's enough death. There's enough. The world lives like it's dead, like it's dying. You know, we should live as though death doesn't exist for us. Amen. It doesn't mean that there isn't sadness when death comes, but we don't grieve like those who have no hope. We look at it. We look at these things and say that is an evident sign that the enemy is really freaking out here. Yes. Yeah. That something is threatening his kingdom. Yes. Right. Now, I may not be able to see it, but he already knows it. That's the evidence in itself. Right. Amen. Which tells me the promise that God gave, not only to me, but to this church, and for anybody who wants to claim it, amen, Isaiah 54 is that we've got to prosper. Yes. We've got to have greater influence. And it's not going to, it doesn't take faith to believe it when you've got a church full of people and they're standing in the aisles. Right. It's when things start getting whittled down. For all we know, God's doing the whittling. Right. He did it with Gideon. He's done it many, many times before. Yep. Yep. So that nobody here can say, look what we did. Because if we could have done it, we'd have done it 10 years ago. We wouldn't be waiting for something to happen. We wouldn't be wringing our hands and going home saying, I wonder where everybody is. And whether we say it or not, we're thinking it. We're feeling it. We're, you know, we're wondering. But we look at things that are not as though they are. And we rejoice. That's faith. Got a little thing on my refrigerator. You, you celebrate. What? How, how's it go? Um, you declare victory in the in, in the face of apparent defeat. Mm -hmm. You declare, you declare abundance mm -hmm. in the face of apparent lack. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. That just two things. But that's that's the attitude mm -hmm. that we're to have about everything. Yeah. And that's what I mean by revelation. It isn't revelation just because you've got the information on the refrigerator. Right. right? Right? It's revelation when you start living out of that truth. And I'm saying the best way to start that is start rejoicing when there's nothing apparently to rejoice about. Even if you've got to fake it. That's what I mean. Even if you just got to go, ha, 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 hallelujah. 
Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, you know, when you're thinking something else, this, what I think doesn't necessarily di dictate who and what I believe. I think lots of stuff. You don't even want to know what a lot of the stuff I think. I don't even want to know. Doesn't mean that's what I believe. Doesn't mean that's what I'm going to do. Right? Your brain is not who you are. Jesus is who you are. The spirit of truth, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Clap your hands if you're totally confused. Sally was ready. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's a lot simpler than I just made it. Praise God. Amen. I'm saying when something is coming against us, it, it, there's no reason to come against a defeated person. You know, if you're down and out, he's looking for somebody who's still up and standing with a weapon. Because you're not a threat anymore. It's those who are a threat mm -hmm. that he comes against. Whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your finances, whether it's in your, you know, your extended family, whether it's in life and death, sickness and health, all of those things the enemy uses. Yep. Because we live in a fallen world. Those are still realities here. Yes. Yes. Even though it's not what God wants. The only mm -hmm. way to change it is to stand in defiance of it. Mm -hmm. Not just stubbornness, but in stubborn faith, in believing that what God has said is true. Yep. If you believe that, you can rejoice. Amen? Amen? You can have joy when you're weeping in your pillow. Because you, you can know this has to pass. Right. And something positive has got to come as a result of it. Yes. Yep. Amen? Amen? It doesn't diminish the pain, it doesn't diminish, you know, the significance of those things. But it magnifies the reality of God and the significance that God plays in this realm. He is the greater truth. He is, he is the greater reality Amen. than anything else that we may experience. And eternity will prove that to us. Amen? Amen. I know it's hard right now. Because I'm thinking, I'm feeling the same thing. I, you, it's depressing. You can't, you can't go to that many funerals in a matter of weeks and not just feel bummed. But the reality is in heaven, it will seem so insignificant. Because it's for eternity. It's forever and ever and ever in the next realm. Not just off floating around in the cloud somewhere. But we are with these people forever and ever and ever and ever. And we'll realize what a small blink in in eternity, this little space and time is. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that's significant is the spirit. Mm -hmm. Everything else is already dead. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't know enough to lay down. Right. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. I'm going to go back in my office and cry for a little bit. I'm just totally bummed.